Hi, this is Meredith with the Cedar Rapids Public Library, and I am so excited to offer to you, beautiful patrons, a very incredible guest for this Read Woke episode. With us today is Mary Vermillion. She is an author in her own right, as well as a professor of English at Mount Mercy University. Today, I'm asking Mary to join us to talk a little bit about her super incredible mystery series starring a uh, lesbian sleuth, as well as some recommended reads. And some of these reads come from her experience teaching an LGBTQ lit class at Mount Mercy. I will say I also have the added honor of having been a Mount Mercy student with Mary, and we were discussing this earlier. I think you're all be so excited when you get to experience a little Mary Vermillion on your own. So, <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you right off the bat, but I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Well, Meredith, I'm thrilled to be here, um, especially with a former student who's so happily a librarian. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk about my uh, writing and my teaching. So would you like me to start with my own novels? Yes. and. And if you don't mind, give us the whole story, but no spoilers. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I had my novels here. So visual aids. I have three mystery novels and, uh, the first one is called death by discount. And I came to write that shortly after I got tenure, I thought, I want to try writing what's most fun for me to read, and that is mystery novels. And uh, at the same time, I was feeling like my hometown of Atlantic, Iowa, which is in southwestern Iowa, was... Uh, dying. Turns out I was wrong about that, happily. <laughs> yeah. But I, I felt like it was, and I sort of wanted to memorialize it. And at the same time, I I wanted to, I wanted my main character to be a lesbian. And uh, most lesbian literature is very urban focused and coastal focused. And so I really, I really wanted to represent a lesbian from a, a small town. Even my very favorite uh, lesbian mystery writer, Ellen Hart, uh, her novels are set in Minneapolis, which is where she lives. But even, you know, compared to Atlantic Iowa, Minneapolis is very urban, <laughs> right? So that was sort of, that was sort of the, the impetus for writing that novel. And I thought, okay, I have a, the character, I have the setting. Um, when I was in high school, I DJ'd at a country music station next to a cornfield, for real. I don't even like country music, <laughs> but it was a great job for a high school student. And so I knew I, I knew I wanted the murder to occur there. It was very creepy there at night. My friends would come out and scare me. Um, so then I just, the rest of it was like, well, what's going to be the backstory? And so I started, I started looking into why small towns were dying and Walmart came up. And, um, the more I researched, the more horrified I became. Um, and it, and it was just, it was just really fun. And I decided I'd, I'd have, um, the murder revolve around a debate about whether Walmart should come to the town. Um, so I, f I hope the novel is fun, but yet also sort of explores a, a, a social justice theme. So that's the first one. Um, and that took place in a fictional version of my hometown. But my sleuth, Mara, um, she actually lives in Iowa City, which is where I live. And uh, she works for Iowa Public Radio. And uh, the second the second mystery was based on, I don't even know if many of your listeners would remember this now, but uh, there was a, a Hawkeye basketball player named Pierre Pierce who, who raped um, a woman on the women's women's basketball team 
And uh, if you're if you're familiar with the story, basically nothing happened to him. Um, and then later he raped another woman. And I just I found that to be horrifying and outrageous. Um, and so that's what the that's what the second one, Murder by Mascot, is is about. Um, and the, the 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 victim in that one ends up at the feet of a of a herky herky on parade was going on at the same time so again i hope the novel's sort of fun um but also that one i think can even um in, to my mind heavier social justice issue um and then the third one uh seminal murder that that revolves around a, a murder at, um, well, in common parlance, a sperm bank, but but an, an IVF lab. And uh, I wrote that just because, um, like my sleuth, I've always um, known that I didn't want children, but obviously most people do and i'm of an age you know i um the well i came of age i guess during the lesbian baby boom you know so lots of my friends um used ivf to have have children and so i just thought it would be interesting to sort of explore um relationships between um lesbians who really bad wanted children and, and lesbians who didn't and i had i had so much fun researching that book because um the the director of that lab at the time gave me a tour and That's talked me through how the process went and then i had several friends um both both straight and queer who were very generous in talking to me about their own experience in in having having children via IVF, uh, so it was you know I just when I write something I also like to learn I love research, um, and so so um, you know the sort of serious part of that book is there's a one of the main characters is, is trying really hard to get pregnant and she just can't and of course that's very painful. Um, and then there's just there's just other other lighter stuff going on with um, in the background. So that's that's the scoop on my three mystery novels. Well, I just really appreciate how you know having grown up in a small town, how I mean, talk about marginalized voices, right? Like how these like smaller town experiences from the first book come to light, and then. I just find it so interesting as you were talking through them and I had known about your books before, but like how <clears throat> it's almost like each and maybe this is just like my my moment of epiphany, but it's kind of a big duh to other like from other people. It's like each one of these novels really explores these kind of traditional versus non traditional scenarios and like a traditional small town and what happens when the big city comes in. Traditionally, men aren't held to the same standards as women and can get away with a lot, right? And then, even within the idea of like the changing, not dynamics, but like what becomes, and not necessarily, I don't want to use the word acceptable, but what's possible for family dynamics. You know, it's be, becoming more uh, available for, I mean, specifically lesbian couples because potentially one of the partners can carry a baby, right? Which is a little different than like gay men using IVF to help create a family that way. But just like how things change. And even like, I don't know, I what I really appreciate, especially about the last novel is how like conventional, like a family like that is. I love how, like, this is how, this is how life can be. I mean, that, that sounds oversimplified, but I think that it's both respectful of all the different ways that people make their families, but also is like, I think it helps to educate others that are like, I don't, I don't understand how this would even work, you know, to a certain degree. Yeah. I don't know. 
I don't feel like I was very eloquent as I explained it, but I just really appreciate the dynamics of each one of your, your novels and how they work differently, but in kind of a same way. I don't know. Thank you. I'll be, well, you're welcome. You're welcome. And I think too, that I love how, how those things all function with a mystery novel. Like, I feel like your brain is so busy trying to figure out the whodunits that mm. those things, although, you know, most people probably realize at face value that like they all have social justice as a part of their, their story, but it's like those things kind of seep in the cracks while you're trying to put together these big pieces and like it all kind of like comes together. And it's a really lovely dynamic or like way to like, have kind of light reading, like these kind of humorous aspects to them to make light of these things, but like real heavy, heavy material. I don't know. I think they're, I think it's, it's just such dynamic writing. There's a lot going on there and it's really exciting to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But sort of my, you know, I think most people read mystery novels for fun, figure out the puzzle, right? Figure out who done it. Um, but I, I think, I think crime fiction is really exciting right now because a lot of it is blending in social justice with the puzzle and the fun and it's a good combo. You just you're setting the bar high. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want I don't want to let our watchers and listeners think that this is the only genre that you write in. You do do other kinds and types of writing. Do you mind just taking a moment to, it doesn't have to be in detail, but what other things do you like to write? I like to write all kinds of things. Um, I have a blog called Midway that um, I, it, it sort of came into being actually after uh, my husband Ben and I ha uh, have been drafting a, a memoir about his gender transition. We've been writing that together. Um, it's It's been on, on hiatus because of um, COVID emotion, <laughs> but um, but one, one thing I realized when when writing that with him is that um, it's really important to recognize when you have mixed feelings and when you're in the middle of things and when you're transitioning. So my, my blog kind of examines a lot of different kinds of middle grounds and transitions. And, you know, to be honest, it kind of lets me write about whatever I want to, a lot of books as well. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, I do the occasional academic writing. Uh, I uh, I do a book club at Anamosa State Penitentiary with Mount Mercy students, and uh, colleague Carol Tix and I wrote an essay about that. Um, that felt really rewarding because my hope was that other people would read it and would try to do similar things. Um, very rarely I'll, I write poetry, um, an occasional short story. Uh, the most the most recent thing I, I have coming out um, actually started in a sort of fluky way. It's a it's a segmented essay called Mixed Bag. And it started actually as a prompt in my creative writing class. Uh, I had my students just write a list of objects and then I said, okay, just write something about one of the objects. And I usually do those exercises along with my students, just, you know, to be fair. And the, <laughs> the one I chose was a bag. Um, and, and, and it ended up being this segmented essay about um, plastic bag usage. But, but the, the, large, the larger issue is environmental grief. And then it was partly about COVID and the film American Beauty. I don't know if you know the plastic bag scene there. Um, and so it's just it's just one of those kind of collage type essays. And uh, it was actually the first time I tried writing something like that. So I was really happy to get it published. It's, it's going to be in a journal, called, an online journal called uh, Survive and Thrive Journal of, of Narrative Medicine. Um, 
it's a that COVID issue. Yeah, because, you know, of course, COVID was very bad for an in increase in plastic pollution, um, among other things. So anyway, that's probably more than you wanted to know. I, I write all mm -hmm. kinds of things. <laughs> fascinating. Well, and one of the things that I really appreciate you, appreciate about you is just the depth and breadth of interests and knowledge that you have like Aww. well it's true though because i feel like you teach everything <laughs> you know <laughs> it's true though whether it's like like british literature or if it's like creative writing it's such a wide spectrum of the things that you that you are knowledgeable about and can teach those are two different things right Mm -hmm. but that you have both of those and then like I just really appreciate hearing you talk about being in a middle ground and going through transitions because we're constantly going through transitions right like the older I get the more I realize like the ride doesn't slow down it just keeps going right <laughs> and so acknowledging that is a really powerful thing and I think it like it builds us up and makes us much stronger consequently, but trying new genres and, you know, tapping into the new experiences that you have as they come along and expressing yourself through words is such a wonderful example of how like people should be, you know? I mean, it's, it's a total growth mindset and it's a wonderful example, I think. I mean, especially to students that you have, you know, that get to watch you do all of this, but to all of us that like stand on the sidelines, you're like, that was great. So I really appreciate Aww. that. Aww. I need to talk to you every day. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> but I think, I think it's true. And especially like this place where we're living right now, you know, we're in just yet another like transition from COVID and things of that nature. You know, it's it's a really hard time always. And now that like, as we find our resilience, it's really empowering, but that can be a really hard thing to find mm -hmm. or recognize. We all have it, but it's hard to recognize and see it as our superpower. So oh, I really yeah. appreciate that about you. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I just, I just find it so, like, I just love your beautiful humanity. When I hear you talk about, and when I listen to interviews, or when I read excerpts of the memoir that you're working on with your husband, oh. because it is the most, like, beautiful, empathetic, and, like, I feel like I have not come across any other work of, like, writing and then hearing you talk about it that says more i see you than that mm. and which is oh. interesting because it really like i see how you both acknowledge one another's feelings but you discuss your own and it's the most it's just the biggest thing that i can imagine in my head sometimes like i think about it from time to time and i recently listened to an interview that you both did with somebody and i can't remember who it was now she has a, a regular podcast. It makes. Uh, I bet it was Liz, maybe Liz McMullen. I think so. Yes. Okay. And and hearing her talk about her relationship that she's in and how, like, I don't know, just it made me see, not like your relationship with your husband, but your lives as so whole and big and lived in. It was just the most amazing thing. Well, most thank amazing. you. You're thank welcome. You. So I can't wait to I, hear more all the time. Well, I have to say that that memoir is by far the hardest thing I've ever written. Um, just because when Ben first started transitioning, I was not supportive. Um, I was, I was what would be called now, well, or I was very close to what would be called now a turf, a trans, how does that go? Trans exclusive radical feminist. You know, I just, because that was, that was the only thing at the time that I had read about transgender people 
And so I, you know, I thought all the negative things, I thought he was misguided and wrong. And, um, you know, thank God he was patient enough with me to give me a chance to um, see that, that he, he, he really was Ben and needed to transition. Um, but you know, I think I think you can see maybe why that would be so hard to to write about. To know that you, for the, for me, I was so hurtful to him at that time, and we almost broke up. And uh, and it's you know, it's just it, it took us a long time to write because it was hard to write, and just you know, things have happened. But like I was in therapy you know, every time you sit down to do that. Right, it's really it's hard. Brutal. It's not right, and I just I just you know like when you talk about change, I just, I was thinking like, you know, the, the words that, that I didn't know when he was trans, when he first started transitioning, like transnormative or cisgender, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think of the vernacular. most people, right, right. Um, and, and I, and I, so I just, and when he was transitioning, I, I didn't actually know anyone else who was transgender. And, you know, of course the world has changed <laughs> so much around around that that issue, just in, I think, in a head spinning way. Um, so, but, and yeah, I, it's, al it's almost like if eventually when we get a publisher for it, it's all, it's, it's really like our, our story will be a bit of, I think, history. Yeah. <laughs> And it really will be, it'll be history because things have changed so much for the better. You know, most young people, sure. I think, are very trans supportive. Um, so, so, yeah, I can't, it'll be, it'll be good when we're in a space where we can sit down and send it back out to publishers and write well, a new intro, maybe. Well, yeah, well, you're right. <laughs> it'll be news this. to him. <laughs> Well, I, I we think, haven't been talking about it, but hi, Ben. <laughs> well, what I think is really interesting about it, too, like, and this just kind of occurred to me, and I think maybe a little bit of a difference is because I know I have met both of you, right? So mm -hmm. I feel like what I heard just now was about how different the social culture is surrounding identity right now. But like what I heard in that interview, when I heard you read parts, each read parts of the introduction, I was like, like, this isn't what you signed up for. I can't imagine like how you had to reconfigure everything in your head about like thinking you're in a relationship with one person and how that looks with a, with a different person, but it wasn't a different person. Like mm -hmm. how interesting. And like, I like, it just, that's why I feel like there's just so, it's just such a big story. I feel like all the emotions are so big. Like the thought space for that is so big. Like I can almost like the, t I feel like that your thoughts are almost like tangibly heavy as I heard you read things, you know, it's like, it was just the most moving moments. And to have you both there reading out loud still together was just the most amazing thing. And I really appreciate the honesty that has to go into that because like, it obviously was not easy to figure all of those things out. And it's just, I think it's just amazing. It's <laughs> true. It's just amazing. That's all. So all you readers out there, just be patient. It's going to be great. It's coming, right? <laughs> Don't right. hold your breath, but right. it's coming. Golly. Well, before I let you go, this, this, um, this beautiful day. Do you mind sharing with us some other books that you might recommend to folks out there about the, the experience? I mean, it is Pride Month, you know, like not that it what? should be, not what? that it, should it be is, one, isn't it? Yes, not that it should be, but it one is. month a year. However, y'all want to do some reading well, and get your pride on. I will, Here we go. I will say, um, the book that helped me the most when Ben was transitioning, um, is called She's Not There by Jennifer Finney Boylan. Um, just a very funny memoir. Mm -hmm. um, and she also writes amazing columns for the New York Times. Um, 
and is interesting to follow on social media. And then, and, and her book is, is pretty well known. Um, a lesser known book about trans experience that I actually taught is called Man Alive by Thomas Page McBee, um, published by City Lights Press. And uh, I can't say enough about that book. It's, it's just, it's so beautiful. The subtitle is A True Story of Violence, Forgiveness, and Becoming a Man. So, so obviously it's about a trans man, but unlike a lot of, of, of trans memoirs, it doesn't, doesn't focus on his physical transition. It, it, it focuses really on his growth as a person. So he's, he's, he's dealing with, with, with sort of two traumas, childhood sexual abuse. And then later he, he when he's mid transition, he and his girlfriend are mugged at gunpoint. So he's also processing that. Um, and the prose is just beautiful. And, you know, yes, of course, much of it is heavy, but by and large, it's just really a hopeful book. And uh, most of my students said that that was their favorite book of all the books I taught in that class. And I, I taught a lot of, of, of great books big names that probably most readers would have heard a lot would have heard already like fun home by Alison Bechtel sort of the book of the queer canon at least in the United States um I also taught oh well here's a book here some people might not know queer poets of color perfect for reading woke because these poems are very needless to say very intersectional so this is very nice anthology put out by Lambda Lit. Um, my students also loved that. Um, and then I, I paired together The Hours and Less, both Pulitzer Prize winners. This one very sort of light and this one, well, not. Um, and then last but not least, Dan S. Smith's Poetry. Um, and he's somebody worth looking up um his his performances because he's an amazing performer but obviously a national book award winner i didn't teach his 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 national book award winner which is um don't call us dead just because i thought this first one insert boy would be more accessible to my students um but those are those are the books that i taught in the class all of them divine but i especially recommend man alive that's wonderful oh i can't thank you enough for sharing your time yourself and your your like professional side with us too with all these book recommendations it has been an absolute joy to have you with us here today for all of you out there in library land stay tuned i will have references to all the books that Mary mentioned here today. I'll also put up on a slide how to get a hold of Mary and follow her, whether it's her blog, Midway, or how to get a hold of her on social media to see what's going on. And as always, from all of us here at the Cedar Rapids Library, thanks for watching. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Goodbye. Here is a closer look at the Mara Gilgannon Mystery Series. Cover art by Morgan Ortman. Here we have Death by Discount, Murder by Mascot, and Seminal Murder. Keep your eyes and ears open for the day when the collaborative memoir that Mary and her husband Ben are currently writing comes into publication. And now for Mary's recommended reads. Less by Andrew Sean Greer is a story of a man who has to choose between going to his ex's wedding and going on a book tour. He chooses both. What ensues is a satire of the American abroad, a rumination on time and the human heart and a bittersweet romance of chances lost. 
In the hours, Michael Cunningham draws inventively on the life and work of Virginia Woolf to tell the story of a group of contemporary characters struggling with the conflicting claims of love and inheritance, hope and despair. And Fun Home is a fresh and brilliantly told memoir from Alison Beschel, marked by comic twists, a family funeral home, sexual angst, and great books. More memoirs include She's Not There, the utterly surprising story of a person changing genders. By turns, it's hilarious and deeply moving. Jennifer Finley Boyan explores the territory that lies between men and women, examines changing friendship, and rejoices in the redeeming power of family. In Man Alive, Thomas Page McBee attempts to answer the question, what does it really mean to be a man? He focuses on two of the men who most impacted his life. One, his otherwise ordinary father who abused him as a child, and the other, a mugger who almost killed him. McBee seeks to understand these examples of flawed manhood and tells us how a brush with violence sent him on a quest to untangle a sinister past and freed him to be the, be the man that he was meant to be. On to poetry. This is the first major literary anthology for queer poets of color in the United States. It was published in 2014 and edited by Christopher Soto. Insert Boy Here is an eloquent and poignant collection of poems expressing the experience of Denez Smith and the experience of being black and queer in the United States. You can also read along with Mary at her blog, Midway. You can find Midway at MaryVermillion.com. You can also keep up with Mary through Facebook, Goodreads, Twitter, and Instagram. This has been another installment of Read Woke.